Hi guys, welcome to Video Academy. My name is Adam Sajilek and today we'll be learning about FPV drone flying. I'll be talking about the basics of FPV, how to get started, and I'll also share a few tips and tricks that I learned along my journey. I hope you enjoy it and learn something valuable. FPV stands for first person view. That means that compared to traditional drones where you use a screen to monitor where your drone is going, use a set of goggles on your head to immerse yourself in the flight and get a first person experience. The experience of flying FPV is kind of like playing a real life video game. Just instead of playing in a virtual environment, you are flying out there in the real world. Now combining the thrill of FPV with a decent camera like a GoPro mounted on top of the drone, you can produce some out of this world footage. Before we get into that, let's talk a little bit about analog versus digital FPV. In the world of FPV, there are two main video transmission systems, analog and digital, and each have its own pros and cons. Analog generally has a better latency, that means that the pilot can react quicker to incoming obstacles. The components needed to build an analog drone are generally a little bit lighter, meaning that the drone is going to be a little bit more agile and faster. On the flip side, Digital usually gets better image quality and better reception and range. This means that the pilot can usually fly farther away and has better image quality so we can see more. Deciding which kind of system is for you largely depends on what kind of flying you want to do. There are many different avenues you can take as an FPV pilot, but the most common three are FPV freestyle, cinematic FPV and FPV racing. FPV freestyle is all about smoothly navigating through your environment while doing tricks along the way. A nice way to think about it is like a skateboarder at a skate park. They fly at the same location and try to perfect their movement to create the most stunning tricks, flips and rolls. FPV freestyle can be both super relaxing or an adrenaline bomb and it all depends on your style and what you prefer. For FPV freestyle you can use both an analog or a digital FPV drone. And even though each flying style would be a slightly different experience, you can easily do freestyle with both. In comparison, in cinematic FPV, digital is probably the better way to go thanks to its increased range and better image quality. That doesn't mean that you cannot fly cinematic FPV with an analog drone, but you will generally have a better time with the digital system, especially if you're a beginner. Cinematic FPV is all about capturing the world around you in the most eye-pleasing way possible. Whether it's surfing down mountains, cliffs and waterfalls, or chasing bikers at a racetrack, the goal is always to fly as smoothly as possible to create a feeling of this ethereal floating camera for the viewer. That is also the style of FPV that I am the most familiar with. Lastly, we have FPV racing, in which analog is the clear winner. Thanks to its lower latency and generally lighter weight, it's much more suited for this style of flying. FPV racing pilots are all about speed. Usually they would race in a course flying through gates, around flags and avoid obstacles trying to achieve the fastest time. FPV drones are generally used for different purposes depending on what kind of pilot you are. So if you're a cinematic FPV pilot like myself, you would generally use them to create amazing footage from a perspective that no other drone can achieve. Um, if you're a FPV freestyler, you would use them to get an adrenaline rush by flying and uh, jumping around obstacles and doing different tricks. And if you're an FPV racer, you would obviously use them to achieve the fastest time in a lap. Now that you have a better idea of the different types of FPV drone flying, let's talk a little bit more about equipment. FPV drones come in a variety of different shapes and sizes. Right here in front of me, I have a 3-inch drone, a 5-inch drone and a 7-inch drone each would be usable for a different purpose. So this 3-inch drone I would generally use indoors when I need to fly close to people and uh, hit small gaps. Thanks to its size, it's a lot easier to maneuver in small spaces. It also doesn't generate as much thrust, therefore uh, it won't be jotted around in the air thanks to its own uh, 
wind. Um, and it also has these guards, which help you not hurt people when you're flying close to them. Then I have this five inch drone, which generally is the most common size amongst FPV drones. Um, it can be used for freestyle, it can be used for racing, it can be used for cinematic. It's a very versatile uh, size of a drone and it's probably one of my favorites as well. And lastly, I have this seven inch drone. This one would be really useful for long range flying or flying across a landscape, thanks to a few factors. Firstly, thanks to its larger propellers, it can stay in the air for longer because it uses the energy from the battery more efficiently. It also has a GPS module, meaning that if I ever lose signal with it, it will attempt to fly back to me so I can regain signal and get it back. And thanks to its larger antennas, it also gets better range. And no matter which drone you fly, you will always need a set of goggles and a controller. And which one you will need depends on which system you're flying and what are your preferences. So I personally fly the DJI FPV system, which classifies as a digital system, which is the one with better quality and better range. So if you're flying analog, you can find radios or controllers anywhere between 1,500 Danish krona, which is roughly 150 pounds, uh, all the way up to 5,000 Danish krona or 500 pounds. Some of the most notable brands are Fatshark and Skyzone. In terms of goggles, the price is generally around the same for analog um, as with the radios. So you can find very cheap ones starting as low as 1000 krona, um, going all the way up to 5000 krona, which in British pounds is around 100 pounds to 550 pounds. To learn more about analog radios and headsets, I would recommend checking out YouTube reviews and scouring the internet because I personally don't have too much experience with them. So I would feel bad recommending you brands that I don't know of. When it comes to digital, your options are a little bit more limited. Um, currently on the market, there are very few companies creating digital transmission systems. One of the most notable ones was DJI, which recently stopped producing their air units, which are inside the drones. So instead they started to produce their own DJI FPV drone. There's still a company called Cadex, which produces these air units that you can put inside your drones and connect them to your old goggles and radios. So if you buy a drone with a digital FPV system inside of it, you will need to buy DJI goggles or DJI radio. There is a possibility to switch out the radio for a different brand, but you will need to install a separate receiver on your drone. I personally use the DJI goggles version one, the DJI radio version one, and the DJI FPV air unit. DJI stopped producing the air units that you would find inside of this particular drone. But you can still get the DJI FPV drone, which I would actually say is a really good beginner drone because it has a lot of the features that these drones don't have. It has a better function of return to home than any of these drones and can also hover in the air if you ever don't feel safe and you can just stop and pull in the air. However, it does come at a cost of around 10 to 11,000 krona for the whole set. That is the goggles, the radio and the DJI FPV drone which isn't that far off from the price of these drones, but it's just something to consider. Now let's talk about restrictions and licenses. So now the most important question. Do you need a license to fly an FPV drone? The short answer is yes, but it's easier to obtain than you might think. FPV drones fall under the A2 category in the European Union. That means that they weigh less than four kilos. To operate a drone in this category, you need to take two tests with 30 questions and 40 questions. There is a website where you can check out all the latest regulations in Denmark. As of January 1st, 2021, the regulations across the whole European Union are the same. The most important rule to remember is that you will always need an observer or a spotter with you whenever you're flying FPV. That's because when you're wearing these goggles, you cannot see the drone with your eyes. Therefore, you need a second pair of eyes to do that. So when you finish your tests and get your certification and have an observer to go with you, you are ready to fly. However, you always need to make sure that you are flying in an area where it's not prohibited. For example, in Denmark, we have a very useful app where you can check out all the restricted areas instantly. Areas where you generally cannot fly include military bases, nature reserves, airports, and publicly unavailable places. So compared to regular drones, FPV drones have its pros and its cons. Uh, one of the largest cons would probably be photography. Um, I've never tried taking photos with an FPV drone and I think it would be quite difficult um, and your results wouldn't be as good 
as with a regular drone, where you can tilt the camera um, and operate the drones at very slow speeds. Traditional drones are also a lot easier to operate. That means that a total beginner would probably have an easier time with traditional drones. However, FPV drones are typically a lot more fun to fly. An area in which an FPV drone excels is speed. That means if you need to follow a biker, let's say, or a runner, that's where your FPV drone will come in really handy because you can keep up with them and keep very close to them and have ultimate control over every single move of your drone. So if you want to start learning FPV, one of the best ways to start would probably be a simulator, which you can install on your computer or laptop. Because there is no money involved in crashing a virtual drone, you can crash as many times as you want and you won't have to feel bad about it. I would strongly recommend spending a lot of hours in the simulator before venturing out to the real world, because it will save you not only money, but also a lot of stress. As a general rule of thumb, I would spend at least 30 to 40 hours in the simulator first, until you feel very comfortable with flying, and then I would go and fly in the real world. Some of the simulators that I would recommend are Liftoff and Drone Racing League, both of which you can download on Steam. So the good thing about the simulator is that you can train in all the different modes, level mode, horizontal mode, 3D mode if you ever want to try that, or acro mode, which is the one that I usually fly in. Though the name of the simulator is Liftoff, you can download it on Steam. I think it's about 10 or 20 euros, but I think it's definitely worth the money. It gets you prepared for the real world. You can fly anywhere you want and uh, you can fly for as long as you want. You also have to deal with battery issues because that's one of the things that kind of sucks about the hobby is that each battery lasts you only about three to five minutes. So if you can just fly around for, you know, 20 minutes straight, you get a lot more used to the sticks and uh, you start trying new things faster. Once you get used to the sticks, it's it's quite easy. It's Then it's more difficult to actually do it in real world because that's where the high stakes are at. Or I wouldn't we try to go very crazy, very close to an object and try not to hit it, but still be very, very close because that's kind of how you get the best results in the real world by being close to objects. So you need to kind of be comfortable with small distances between you and your subject because that's kind of what produces the best results. It's pretty realistic. The drone does feel a little bit floatier, like the, the gravity doesn't affect you as much. There's also none of the annoying things that are in real world, such as drag or um, wind. So I suppose there might be more realistic simulators out there, but this one is by far one of my favorites. I think I've put in a, around 30 hours into the simulator. And it's basically how I learned to fly FPV drones. Something that a beginner might also appreciate is different flight modes on a drone. So to start off, I would start in what's called a level mode, where no matter what your input is from the right stick on your controller, if you center it, the drone will always level itself and it will not tip over to the front, to the back, to the left or to the right. However, as you get better, I would switch to acro mode, where the inputs from your right stick stay with the drone and you can fly a lot faster and be a lot more agile. So how would I approach an FPV project for a client, let's say? Um, first of all, you need to start with a lot of prep work. Um, ideally, I would go to the location beforehand, scout it and see what are the best avenues I can take as an FPV pilot what things I want to highlight, uh, where can I position my models, etc. Some of my favorite spots are forests, mountains, waterfalls and just in general good looking landscapes. And if you're looking for a way to spice up your footage, you can always include people, which will interact with the environment and help the viewers stay more focused. However, you need to be aware that they have to give you permission first to fly near them. Another thing that I always try to look out for are holes, windows, doorways, anything that I can fly the drone through to make the footage really exciting. The closer you fly to objects will generally produce better footage, but if you're a beginner, I would start off a little bit higher and then gradually go down lower and lower to the ground. Another thing that you always need to make sure to bring with you is a lot of batteries, because these things don't last very long. A regular battery like this one would fly for about three to five minutes, depending on how fast you go. You also need to remember to take good care of your batteries and discharge them when they're not in use to not shorten their lifetime. While filming, I always try to make sure that everybody's aware of the drone at all times. To record footage on an FPV drone, 
you would generally use a GoPro camera attached to the top of the drone. Since FPV drones are generally quite shaky, you will need to find a way to stabilize your footage. If you have a newer GoPro model, you can use its in-body stabilization called Hypersmooth. However, for the best results, I would recommend getting stabilization software called Real Steady Go. It is paid, but it is definitely worth it. So back to the drones that I would recommend. Either you can go with the DJI FPV drone, but if that's too expensive for you, I would probably recommend going with a cheaper analog drone where you can really learn the drone itself first and then you can step up to a more expensive drone. The basic list of things that you will need to start flying FPV is the drone itself, a radio controller, goggles, and ideally some sort of a camera that you can attach to the top like a GoPro, and tons of batteries. There are a couple of tools that are very handful for flying FPV. One of them is, for example, this one, which allows you to quickly switch propellers while on location. Okay, guys, we are at Bubiak, one of the most beautiful cliffs in Denmark, and we're gonna film some FPV footage. Um, it's pretty good weather so far. The wind is not that bad. Unfortunately, we have some cloud coverage, but uh, that might actually play in our favor because then we're gonna get more dynamic range out of our camera. So yeah, uh, we're gonna get set up for the first shot um, and get everyone involved. And uh, hopefully it's gonna be good. Let's go. Like you see the beach over there. There's a similar beach a little bit down that way. I think you can actually see it from here. And uh, we can get some cool footage there too. It's also pretty windy today. So that will be something to account for. You have to think about the way the wind blows, so it will push your drone. So you will need to counter that. And obviously if the wind is too strong, then it's better to just fly in an area where you have some coverage. Luckily there's not that many people today, so partially thanks to the weather, but um, it's always a good thing. You don't want to fly close to people. You should always stay at least 30 meters away from people who are not involved in the flight. And you can get up to five meters if you're flying in slow speeds, but since we're flying FPV, we're most likely not gonna fly in slow speed. So 30 meters. So I think with the first like one or two batteries, we'll just do a couple of warm up rounds, kind of feel the wind, see how it affects the drone's uh, trajectory and uh, flight characteristics. And uh, yeah, that should then give us more confidence going down these hills and uh, especially if we're flying above the water or near the water, you always want to be careful because the drones are not very waterproof. So you could actually, like if we're standing here, we could probably fly all the way to those hills back there and then fly back, which would make for a really nice shot. So they said the uh, sky should clear up in like one hour. I guess fingers crossed. So far it doesn't look like it, but uh, at least you get to see Denmark in its most natural environment. I think it'd be really cool to fly underneath here, through these little cracks and above the water. I think we're gonna try that. I think I'm pretty confident in uh, seeing what the location is like. So I think we can go back to the car and uh, get our equipment, get it started. I think the first shots that we'll get are gonna be on the other side of the cliff. Then we'll get a few on this side of the cliff and then a few down here on the beach and then maybe a few over the hills. And uh, yeah, we'll see. Maybe we'll think of something on the way as well. All right, so. So since we want to have our subject going down the stairs, we obviously don't want to have ourselves like the pilots and the people looking at the drone. We don't want to have them in the shot, ideally. It just doesn't look that good, usually. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna find a spot for the pilot, and which is me and, uh, and Jakub, which is gonna be the observer. And then we're gonna tell the subject what to do and at which point to do it. So, so you will just go down the stairs. Should I take off my hoodie? It's up to you. If you feel more comfortable with the hoodie, you can have it on. But uh, it's basically just, we're gonna find a space for me and Jakub to hide and, uh, and still get the good range. And then 
at some point we're just gonna shout, just go, and just gonna go down the stairs. I don't, yeah, I don't think you need to run or anything, just going down slowly. Cool. And the drone might get quite close too, so just don't get scared. Try to, try to, <laughs> try to, try to ignore it and try to like act as if it's not there. Yeah. To kind of sell the illusion that it's not a drone. Yeah. Cool. If you have some other people on set, it's a, it's a good way to kind of let them know, you know, your framing and what you're actually filming. Because, you know, with the regular camera setup, you always have a monitor so that people who are not filming can see what you're actually filming. Um, and with FPV, since you're the only one seeing the goggles, the other people kind of have no way of, you know, ha having a say in, in what you're actually uh, filming. So especially if I'm with a client, I would always use a monitor to kind of, you know, show them the perspective that I'm seeing and they can have a say in, you know, things that they would like to include, things that they wouldn't like to include and etc. This is the controller for Mavic 2 Pro. Um, at the time of this recording, I think it's the only option for you to actually monitor the flight. There are, you know, other displays out there that you, you can connect your um, goggles to them, but it won't display the flight for some reason. So DJI, unfortunately at this moment, is the only way you can kind of see the flight, at least from a DJI drone. I mean, if I'm flying just by myself, then I wouldn't use a monitor, so that would make things a little bit faster and easier. But uh, since we are flying for the masterclass, I think it's a good idea to include it then, so you guys can see what I'm seeing. So we'll start off with the five inch, uh, just cause that's the one that I'm more used to. Um, and I also kind of prefer it, the way it flies. I just like it a bit more. But uh, we might also try the seven inch later. When you're strapping the battery on the drone, always make sure to strap it real tight so it doesn't fly off. And uh, when you're connecting the cables, make sure that the, the cable that you check the voltage of the battery with. and. Uh, you don't want to have that one hit the propellers. So we always make sure that it's out of the way of the propellers. Same with the XT60 cable. Checking the image on the GoPro and it looks pretty good. Usually I would use around 100 shutter speed and um, 4K at four by three aspect ratio to make sure that then later when I stabilize it in real study, real study will cut off the top and the bottom part, which will then result in a regular 16 by nine uh, ratio for YouTube, Facebook, whatever. 5,500 white balance, uh, which is daylight. And then the minimum ISO possible, depending on the conditions. I unfortunately lost my NDs with the previous drone, but usually I would use an ND filter to kind of lower the shutter speed. So today we'll have to go with a little bit of a higher shutter speed, so we won't get as much motion blur, but at least we'll still get good picture quality and we won't blow out the skies. But usually I would use an ND filter. bit scary. <laughs> Was it fast? I think we can go a bit faster. Actually one of the worst things that can happen to you is when you have a really good flight then you come and turn off the GoPro but instead of turning it off you just turn it on. <laughs> so don't forget to start the recording before you start flying. Uh, the next shot we'll do is gonna be the drone flying up high then dropping down going alongside the cliff and then alongside the beach maybe 100-200 uh, meters that way. So it'll be really cool to maybe have you there, kind of walking past the beach, taking photos, chatting. It'll be actually cool to have you both. So I think I'll fly from over here to get the best signal coming down the cliff. And then alongside the beach, the signal is gonna have a clear way. There's no obstructions in the way, so it should have uh, should get pretty good video and, uh, and radio as well.
That was a good one. It's a good idea to get drone insurance. If you happen to injure someone or damage some property, then you're covered. Unfortunately, there isn't really a way to cover the drone itself. If you crash, you most likely just have to buy a new one or repair it. Um, if you do buy the DJI FPV drone, they do have a program which you can sign up for, where if you crash and recover the drone, you can send it back and get a new one for a small fee. But with these drones, if you crash and you destroy them, you are pretty much screwed. Um, I did the mistake in Norway, where I was flying for several days without backing up my footage from my GoPro camera. And then I happened to crash into a waterfall. And I couldn't recover the drone at all, which meant that all of my footage was lost. So please don't make the same mistake and back up your footage. How do you go from an okay pilot to better and great? Um, you just need to practice a lot. You need to put a lot of hours into the simulator. Um, I wouldn't consider myself an amazing pilot per se, but I always try to get better. Always try to challenge yourself and set realistic challenges for yourself. Don't try to go too hard on your first flight. Otherwise you might just crash and you might not like it at all. So go gradually, but don't be afraid to try new things. So if you want to get inspired, um, a couple of accounts that I would recommend you that you follow are Johnny FPV, um, Shaggy FPV, or one that's located in Denmark called Marius FPV. Watch a lot of other pilots fly and try to learn from them. Also, by seeing their ideas, you can get inspired and uh, maybe come up with new flight paths that you didn't think were possible before. What are the skills that you need to become a drone filmmaker? I think if you have started with traditional drones first, you will already have some sort of a basis to get better in FPV. Um, but you can definitely come into FPV as a total beginner as well. Um, you definitely need a lot of patience because just in general, the drone flying experience takes a lot of time and you need a lot of time to learn. Um, you also not need to be afraid to try new things and potentially break expensive equipment. Um, and yeah, I think you also need to be a little bit creative. Um, but that will come with time. Yeah, so so definitely the first few flights you do, you will probably get sick and you will get dizzy. But after a while, once you get used to it, it's just as regular as driving a car. You just don't even think about it. But if you're the type of person that gets dizzy very easily, um, just be aware that it might happen to you at first. But if you get through that, then you can have an amazing experience afterwards. Well, I've already mentioned the Norway project where I crashed my drone and lost all the footage. But on the other hand, one of my funnest projects that I filmed was with a company in Aarhus called Aarhus Water Sports, where we filmed a one shot take with the drone flying inside buildings, outside buildings, above the water, um, chasing wakeboarders. Um, and it was a lot of fun to do that project, primarily because there were so many people involved and we had so many different things and different cues and everybody had to be synced in the perfect time. And when you finally get that shot with everybody doing the right thing and you fly the perfect path, it is extremely satisfying. So that is one of the reasons why I love to fly FPV. One of my most recent projects was with these four talented athletes from Fredericia who are training to compete in the 2024 Paris Olympics. And what we did is we had a runner, we had a biker, we had a swimmer and we had a rifle shooter. And with the runner and the biker, we decided to use FPV as a way to capture um, their sport in a very fast paced and actionable way. And I think it worked out great. Currently, I'm primarily filming cyclists and runners, but I would definitely love to get more into car to FPV drone flying. Um, as well as more travel, drone flying in general. I love to travel and capturing beautiful landscapes is, is very much in my blood. But um, yeah, that would be something that I would love to get more of in the future. Actually, one of my bucket list projects would be to shoot an amusement park uh, following the different uh, rides. I think that would be really cool.
If there's anything I would like you to take away from this masterclass, is to remember to practice in the simulator first. Always bring a spotter with you to the location. Learn the different drone laws and restrictions. Scout the location beforehand to make sure that you get the best flight path possible. And always back up your footage. Thanks for watching guys. And thanks to Video Academy for letting me host this masterclass. I hope you've learned something and found it enjoyable. I wish you happy flying. Thank you.